So we've had cool guests here on Jay's Corner. We've had Kevin Cole, Nation's Best Gershwin Pianist, Bob Powell, financial journalism legend. We've had Ann Lester, who ran retirement services at J.P. Morgan Investment Management. We've got an expert from poker, Kevin Rabishow, world-class poker player, as well as poker coach. Poker and finance have almost an endless list of things in common probability based, variance, randomness affecting the ultimate result. You know, there's a saying you're not supposed to meet your heroes. Either the saying is wrong or Kevin's an exception. You're at University of Chicago and you're studying poker. Yep. You're going to <laughs> charity local charity rooms and then you graduate. And were you going to become a professional poker player right out of the gate? Yeah. 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 The, the, timing there was kind of funny uh, you know i i remember um perhaps you weren't familiar with black friday at the time black friday within the poker community especially the american poker community was like a really big um was a really big deal it was a pivotal time in the industry so i graduated about three weeks before black friday so just to to kind of lay out what that means um in two in early 2011 Tons of tons of kids my age or or people like me were exploring the idea of professional poker. You could just sit online and play a game and and make pretty good money if you were talented. Um, and seventy five percent of that business existed in the United States. So so seventy five percent of the global mm -hmm. online poker business was American. Um, and then on tax day on April fifteenth, twenty twenty eleven, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice uh, indicted all three of the biggest online poker companies simultaneously froze all of their assets across the world. And that meant that the players had their funds frozen as well. So right. I, I was a professional poker player in Chicago for about three weeks. <laughs> and, and then immediately oh my. my accounts were frozen and, and all of my peers accounts were frozen and we had to kind of scramble to get, um, to, to put a plan together to either pursue professional poker outside the United States or, or move on to something else. Um, so yeah, I, I graduated. I was a I was planning to be a pro poker player. That lasted a few weeks, and then I had to kind of shift my plan towards towards going to Vegas and then moving to Canada. You, from your experience, and of course, you know you're many levels up, right? But let's just say, like somebody just has like, oh, there was this poker. I see this romantic game. I see their TV shows on it. And um, do you think that people have the basic understanding of the prop, just like base probabilities of how poker actually works or uh, um i mean i i think that there are a small number of people within the community who understand like how it actually works i think a lot of those people have have built tools for poker a lot of those people have have kind of used that understanding or that that knowledge to like create things um it's pretty rare, I think, for the typical poker player. I mean, the, the high level players, they they all get most of it or or they get what they need to get. You know, they understand they understand enough that that they're not going to make any like huge fundamental errors. Um, but sometimes you'd be surprised that, you know, some pretty good players just have like a, a gap in their understanding. And because it, it sometimes just doesn't matter. Like it, it's I guess it's not. Not every. It doesn't concept. matter why. How doesn't it matter? Like you're sitting well, here with a twenty-five thousand dollar buy-in. Yeah. You know, you're five people left. Every the edge has got to be like so minute. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking of like, like there are there are fundamental, let's say like there's mathematical or like statistical building blocks to you know a, a game. Like there's there's game theoretical knowledge in the educational sense that like if you didn't fully understand it, you could still win money or or you know, maybe if you don't fully understand, like, um, for example, like why an equilibrium is an equilibrium, or like, if you don't understand, you know, what makes an e like a multiplayer equilibrium unstable, like those are relatively advanced mathematical concepts. Does it matter so much to like your poker strategy, like how well you execute your poker strategy that you understand those, those kind of more advanced mathematical concepts? Like maybe not. I, I think, you know, it's certainly beneficial to understand it, but like not everyone's going to get it. And that, that doesn't necessarily hurt them as poker players. What people don't know, <clears throat> probably uh, you have company uh, with people who are educated like you or with backgrounds where we are studying like you have had. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the, like the people that I spent time with in university, uh, were other poker players. And like a lot of them, a lot of them are still professionals. They, they've gone to different places, you know, some, I, I have like close friend in Chicago, close friend in Macau, you know, uh, like a bunch of people who I guess we, we interacted with because we were all kind of in the same circles. And I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people, um, I think in poker with, with the same sort of story. Uh, I guess it's just a matter of like being lucky enough to find the time to play poker when you're also swamped with your, with your, uh, educational work. Right. So wait a minute, you went to university of Chicago and for, you you know, it's, a, it's that quirky school, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's <laughs> yeah. not Harvard, it's not Stanford with the, with the bigger names, but you know, the pure academics would absolutely put it as equal for sure. Yeah. What, what are, what are mom and dad Rabishow saying? <laughs> that's a, yeah that's a fair question um when when my mom retells the story now uh she she frames it as if i kind of tricked her into letting me like <laughs> go go into professional poker because i kind of framed it as this temporary thing like oh you know i'll just i'm gonna go to toronto for six months and try things out and see how it goes and I, I know for many years in the back of her mind, she's like, so when's he going to get that master's degree? Like, when's he going to go? Right. <laughs> when's he going to get right. a real job? Um, I think my dad was just, he he thought it was cool. He was on board um, pretty Is early right? on. Yeah. I don't know. My, I mean, my parents are great. Like they're, they've just been really trusting and supportive of, of me, like more than what it is that I'm specifically choosing to do. You know, it, it's just gotcha. kind of like, I bring them ideas and they just believe me, you know, and they, they haven't seen me crash and burn yet. So I guess I've, I've built up a, a bit of trust with them over time, but yeah, even, even 21 year old me saying like, yeah, I'm just going to pack up my stuff and go click buttons from Toronto. They were like, all right, have fun. Like <laughs> be safe. That's quite a change because obviously that's not the standard track at the university of Chicago. I mean, it by, by, it, by it was hard. Distance, I mean. I do, th I do think the the sunk cost on the tuition was hard to stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so today, if you had to do it over, do you even go to college? Um, I think probably not. I mean, it's funny, like that. May maybe if I do it over, I go to college, but I don't, but I don't invest so much time and money into the specific college that I'm choosing, right? And and mm. maybe I'd leave myself some flexibility to like go for two years and then take a break, or, or you know what I mean? Like it, it's just that. The U Chicago application and the and the degree oh. was such a big commitment. It was bo both financially and with my time. Um, and I think to just like sign up for that when you're 17 and then lock in and, and finish the whole thing out is like maybe a little narrow minded. Right. Um, so I, I got a lot of value out of like the college environment. I connected with a bunch of people who Right. I mean, I kind of got sure. serious about poker because of the college environment. If I just skipped right. it entirely, who knows how that goes, right? Maybe I don't have the peers around me who are pushing me in a certain direction. Maybe I don't have any collaborative uh, value from living on campus. I I was in Chicago, but I did I did still live on campus all four years, so that was that was beneficial, I think. Tell us about what you do now, as far as teaching yeah. others. Yeah, uh, Run It Once is where like my training content has gone. So I produced a course for them last year called The Game Plan. I've I made videos um, pretty regularly over the last eight or nine years uh, that are that are hosted on their site. So so that's all under their elite subscription. Um, that's where I've done most of my teaching. Um, but I you know I I would separate that from coaching. I suppose like over the last several years, I've I've done more coaching, so more private work uh group work just one-on-one -on -one, um mentorship and and all that kind of stuff um is it is described on my website um but that's that's kind of you know th those are two separate ventures and i try to approach them in different ways right like teaching you want to you want to convey like concepts that help everyone you want to you want to put out material that um applies to the masses and and just whatever it, it it speaks um more more widely and and private coaching is very much like i try to get to know try to get to know someone better try to understand like what it is that they're good at and what it is that they're not good at and and help fill in the gaps i mean a lot of a lot of the stuff that i do when i coach when i coach people a lot of times it's like well how do you e even professional poker players a lot of the stuff that i work with them on is just like being more professional which which sounds like 
a little ridiculous. Like usually you would think that, oh, we're talking about advanced strategy or something like something from a solver. And we are, we are usually, but a lot of times like the most helpful stuff I give to people is, you know, like, Hey, how come, like, how come every time you study, you're doing that thing. Right. And like, that's not, it's not helping you. Like that's not, um, you know, every, every time you sit down for an hour, like you only have one hour a day and you're using it on this, like that seems like a mistake. Right. Or, or even just silly stuff, like not saving, not saving their work as they go, <laughs> like the stuff that you like, like habits you pick up because you're organized because to get through university, you kind of have to be. And it's like, you know, a lot, a lot of people who didn't do that, it's not, it doesn't come natural to them. So they start using a program like PO solver and it's, it's like, good luck. I mean, this program is, is ridiculously technical. Well, um, we got to know each other a few minutes and I mean, you studied math and, or, you know, statistics and economics and, you know, you know, my background, some of the followers that I know, you know, will know that I, you know, I've also spent time in Hyde Park. I, I mean, this is the bedrock of, you know, probability, EV, yeah. variance, et cetera, et cetera, are running in the lifeblood of what you learned as an 18 year old. And now as a professional poker player, the application's got to be everywhere, I would think. If we talked about the masses, what would you say are like, I don't know, and I'm sure there's a long list in your person from your point of view, but misconceptions like right out of the, right out of the gate about mm. poker itself. Are there common ones, commonalities that you found? Yeah, I guess it depends on like like who um who we're thinking of, like who um if 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 I'm speaking to someone in a casino, for example, like in a in, in the live environment. Um, who's not so familiar with the online game, uh, then I think that there's like a general misconception that the online game is is like very math based and very like it like it's this abstract kind of idea of of poker as you know oh the people have their strategy mapped out and they're just like they're just clicking the buttons that follow that strategy and it's like no that's I mean that's a good description of people who cheat I guess but it's not really a good description of like your average online poker player. Your average online poker player is just like some kid who, you know, probably works pretty hard in, in terms of studying. Um, but when they sit down to play, they're just like, it's it's like a video game. They're just playing on instinct, right? Like a lot of them don't don't know the math that well. And then and I think vice versa, like a lot of a lot of people who haven't played much in a casino might have this misconception that like live tells are are really valued. Like, you know, if you've watched Casino Royale or something, you think that like the little blink of an eye or these these Oreo tells from, from, uh, from the classic rounder scene, like are, are a big part of the game. And it's like, uh, most people who play in a casino aren't really that good with that stuff. They're not, they're not exactly like picking up magic tells They're They're mostly just like sitting in a social environment and playing a strategy game. Like it's not, it's not really. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that's sort of, you know, the, the masses have the popular, um, understanding of of those games right there once you get inside of it you realize it's just like it's just people playing a strategy game i think there's a, a common uh understanding that there's like you know very uh strategically advanced players around and and people have their own ideas of who those people are i think that for the most part though like that gets played up by a lot of people um hmm. there's just there's just so many poker players like poker is such a popular game, like worldwide or, or especially in America, yeah. like poker is such a popular game. There's so many poker players. There's, there's only like the community of really, really advanced players is quite small relative to, to how big poker is. So I, I think that, um, yeah, I don't know, like the reputation, some, some people's reputation just gets like really, really blown up. Cause it's like, Oh, you played in that game or oh you did that. And like, I don't know, even, you know, I feel this myself too. Like you, if you talk to, if you talk to me about like, uh, how I'm feeling when I'm playing a game, right? Like I'm being super critical. I'm thinking about all the stuff I can change. I'm thinking about all the mistakes that I made, like, uh, you know, it, with, within, within this world, it's like, oh, we have so much to learn. We have, like, there's, there's so much improvement to be made. Um, so I feel like everyone must feel that way. The players who want to play and want to become professional do they have a handle sensitivity to it to that degree as you greater than you? Well, how would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of something that's been on my mind lately that maybe, 
you know, is outside the scope of this conversation, but like the, the community of poker players is so diverse. Like it, it's really hard to, it's really hard to boil down the, the prototypical poker player. Cause I think there's mm. just, there's, there's a lot of different reasons people get into poker and end up pursuing it professionally. Um, I think that 15 years ago, my story was very common. The, the story of like, you know, 15 to 23 year old guy who has free time and has a bit of competitive drive, you know, finds this game because of money maker or because of whoever, you know, like right. the, the poker on television and then just like realizes they can do it on the internet. And because, you know, the older generation hadn't quite adopted internet poker yet, the competition was just not really there. So, so there were, that's a, that's a big portion of the former poker community now, like the way I see the poker community, there's there's people who come at it from, you know, strictly just casino life. There's people who come at it from from other sports and and pick it up as like a competitive venture. There's there's all sorts of uh, different people. So uh, I probably would have told you that ten years ago, like, oh yeah, this is like we have we have the competitive edge. Like anyone who has a schooling background and learned it this way, like that's the right way. And I'm now it's kind of like ah, you know, that's that's one way to do it. Um, I do think it's an advantage. But I think that people who come up like a different way, for example, a lot of um, a lot of poker players, I think Nick Shulman's a good example of this, like kind of came up through the gambling world and even from other gambling ventures. I think he was like a pool shark. So he, he came up through like billiard halls and stuff like that. And when you come up that way, you develop a different sense for how to be good at at this kind mm -hmm. of competition. Totally different from what I was good at. Like I was good at, you know, formal strategy, structure, mathematical kind of approach. and. But when someone like me goes into a casino, like you, you do kind of get eaten alive for a little while because you realize all the stuff you don't know. You realize all the like soft skills that are valuable when you're playing, when you're competing in person in a game like this. Um, so yeah, I think there's more than one way to go about it for sure. Is, is that how you would explain Phil Helmuth? <laughs> it's hard to, <laughs> it, I don't know. It's hard to explain Phil Helmuth in just a few words. He's, um, but he, but he's from the eighties, right? I mean, he, he grew up in a, in a different type of competitive environment where different types of skills were valuable. And I think, I think when he was young and like when Daniel Negreanu was young and those guys like Eric Seidel, whatever, like when they were younger and they, and they got into that world, like they were just different. They just saw everything different than the competition. Um, so that's probably a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's pretty funny because you see also fair amount of rocks being thrown at Phil Helmuth, right. Uh, as far as, you know, He's bad. He's, you know, he stinks, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then you can also, and, you know, poker players being, well, let's not be result oriented. We run this, you know, exercise a hundred times. We're right, yeah. you know, a third of the time, it, you know, and you're priced in, you call, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But not, and so you could have made the statement, well, Phil Helmuth was lucky once, but this is a lot of times <laughs> of, of it's, that it's same. true. <laughs> it's true it's i mean I, like i think poker is interesting it's kind of like i i wish i was more into golf because i think that golf is like a reasonable comparison to poker where the the people people can have 40 50 year careers in the sport which is like very different from most athletics right like most of the right. time when you hear when you hear like charles barkley on tnt like pontificating about the centers of today or whatever in the nba it's like it doesn't matter because he's not still playing and is he's not trying to compete in his fifties with the kids who are in their twenties. So like it's, it's just different, but poker, I, I guess for better, or for worse, like you can have people from four decades ago, completely different approach, completely different generation actually competing today, head to head with new generation. So now there's that whole conversation of like, are we better? Like which one is better is being tried out in real time, which is right. kind of, uh, and, and I, tend to think that like people who stick with updates and new generation, you know, learning, like stick, they, they improve with the competition. They hang around they're They are better people who refuse to change or, you know, eventually outdated and start to lose. Um, but I don't, you know, I won't say which category Phil Helmuth's in. I'll, I'll just but, say that that's, that's the way that I see it. <laughs> but it looks like even like people from that era have adopted, adjusted, changed, you know, Negranu as a, you know, a good example. example. 
Yeah. Right. Where it was clear from what he was saying that, in fact, he had done a fair amount of studying mm -hmm. to adopt to, you know, Kevin's techniques, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's just it is he's he's kept up with with what's changing. Right. Like even if you don't want to use and I do this myself, sometimes I find myself being like the person who says this, like I I follow new information. I download new tools. I listen to new courses. I don't necessarily implement what I'm hearing, but I but if you're not aware of what's changing and if you're not aware of what the new generation is thinking about, then like, how can you stay competitive? Right. I mean, that, that doesn't seem, you can disagree with new school ideas, but you can't just ignore them as if they're nonsense. Sorry. Could, could you excuse me for, could we like pause I'm for a second? I'm, exactly, I'm watching my, uh, me too. exactly me too. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting point that you were talking about seeing different information and at least like being aware that it exists out there because in finance yeah. you have this all the time right where you get headlines and hot takes of this, this that or the other and then you kind of got to be at least aware that it exists that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that you think it's right or wrong or that you're going to adopt it that day etc right. etc in poker are there really though false narratives i mean you know it's so interesting because the parallels, the reason I have you uh, wanted to even approach you at all is because the parallels between poker and finance, as well as the misnomers, mislabeling are, you know, very, very similar to me, mm -hmm. but in poker, as far as you can see it, are there like wrong concepts? You run a coaching club, you, you run a teaching site. So, I mean, you're a poker teacher, <laughs> so clearly you have your you know, stake planted in the ground on the way that Kevin sees the world. Right. Uh, do you see wrong on the planet as far as poker um, coaching information? I mean, what I, what I see is like, uh, so I know that Phil Galfon has, has written about this in his newsletter recently. And I think the stuff that he puts out is like really similar to the way that I think about learning in poker, which is just like, there are really common uh i might call them heuristics but like uh, there's this like ingrained uh incentive for a lot of people to think a certain way like you you have uh really old school ideas that have never faded i guess is is kind of what i'm thinking about right so like uh bluffing when you have a chance to to draw to the best hand as a as a broad concept as an example of like people who are getting into poker learn about semi bluffing and they get really attached to this idea of like, oh, when I have a chance at making a draw, I bluff with that hand. And and if that's your whole idea of bluffing, well, it's, you know, it, it's this tiny, tiny piece of information that may or may not matter that's guiding the whole way you think about bluffing. And a lot of people don't realize they have that sitting in the back of their mind, right? So I see a lot of that um, coloring the way that people approach strategy, coloring the way that people think about what's right and wrong and and not 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 as much like, yeah, not not bad narratives, not false narratives, but just like maybe misguided um, rules that that determine the way everyone thinks about the game. That is so fascinating because I could, like I said, and I, as we've pointed out, I could draw a direct line between, you know, the exercise of poker generally, and then also even like the learning and the information. Like if I could tell you that about finance, for example, it'd be like the, yeah. in fact entire newsletter that i have is all about debunking you know <laughs> this isn't right this isn't exactly this yeah. isn't. and then what ends up happening is like you know right there's like survive then all the you know behavioral biases you know the entire behavioral finance you know the bias availability bias confirmation bias etc cetera, etc cetera, what you know what you'll call results oriented etc cetera, etc cetera. and and yeah. now off we now the uh the snowball starts rolling downhill and all of a sudden it's like an avalanche. And now you've got, do, do you find in your teaching, whether or not one-on-one uh, -on -one or to the, in your classes that you're spending time trying to unwind it? I mean, yeah. or in, in a weird way, I would have almost liked you to hit clone yourself and your ideal student is another 18 year old Kevin, right? Where you don't really yeah. have preconcept. Yeah. Yeah, I find, I mean, uh, you know, I, I guess two things come to mind. One, for sure, a huge part of my coaching, and, and I even put together a course almost entirely around this concept, is like most people are not approaching learning in a systematic way, and the, and the way that they learn by default 
has has just led them to focus on like the wrong things and and pay little to no attention to other things not not focus on the wrong things that i shouldn't say that but just focus on a limited scope of of what you know the game is and not focus on the whole thing um or they have these misconceptions that i that i do it takes a while in private coaching i find to really like catch you, you have these little aha moments when you've worked with someone for five or ten hours and eventually they say something that it's like oh do you, right like have you always thought about that right like it it just pops up every now and then. It's like, oh wow, like okay, let's let's work on that. Like that that needs to go, um, right? Sure. But then, then also, like you know, the fresh eighteen year old who's just getting into the game, even they have their own, like they find poker with a certain lens on it. You know, they they've got a limited idea of what what is important in the game and what isn't important. And when I when I play against like 21, 22 year olds who have done really well online and maybe we we play in the casino for the first time, I think even they like I have a good idea of, oh, like you're good at these things, but not those things. Right. So everyone kind of has their um, their limited area of expertise. And a lot of the coaching is just about finding like, OK, you're already good at those things. Let's stop devoting time to those things. Let's find those things you're not good at and and push a lot of attention over there. Is it? a thing of order or is it like it, it sounds so similar <laughs> when, whenever <laughs> somebody asks me about you know some concept about some financial contract it could be simple it could be yeah. complex but then like you pointed out and then all of a sudden some like line comes out in an email and i'm like wait a minute wait a minute we <laughs> you know we've got to back up we've got to back yeah. up not one step we've got to back up four or five steps yeah. to kind of start over here because this is so far off base. And if you're considering all the other, you know, adjacent topics around it with that mm -hmm. theory thought process in mind, all of a sudden you realize, Oh, we're off track Yeah. on your coaching. So then this sounds like it has to be fairly constant, your communication, because it's, you're, you're not sitting, you're not living with them or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They're just telling you a sound bite, et cetera, about a particular situation. Yeah, to make sure that it's ingrained. Do you, are you worried that you know they hang up the phone, they, they you know, <laughs> discard what you say, or just revert back to old habits, or how does that? Yeah, work? I mean that's that's definitely always a risk. I uh, I for a while I thought of poker coaching a lot like uh, physiotherapy because I was I was having I had shoulder surgery like six years ago and I was uh, I was working with a physiotherapist and I realized like wow so much of your job is just getting people to the point where they think they they are better and then they leave and they never come back and they're and they just get worse at some point and then they come back and and I was like oh that's that's so similar to what I see in poker coaching um I've I've tried and it's hard to do this for everyone but I've I've tried to make my coaching more uh mentorship like so more mm -hmm. more consistent communication with the student uh more formats of coaching like not just let's review hands on this call but also let's have a chat group where we talk back and forth pretty regularly let's have you record some videos of yourself playing and and speak while you play and then send that to me and i can review it and i can take notes that one's really good for for catching like the the negative um uh you know heuristics in their, in their thought process yeah poker out loud's great po uh, out I to for why. <laughs> yeah i thought that was a i thought that was such a great concept and i was gonna yeah. make like i wanted to make a whole course around that concept it never really came to fruition but i i thought that understanding the way i even did a, a run at one series where i analyzed the it was like a meta analysis of the analysis in poker out loud and I was trying to catch. I was trying to catch all the places where my thought process was flawed, or or my opponent's thought process was flawed, because we're speaking while we're playing, and like a lot of times, you know, you don't think that clearly while you're playing. Um, that I, I stuff is you, really interesting to me. I, I thought so too, and you know, shout out to them, you know, and the format, right? Because yeah, someone like me knows how to play, kind of, you know, has some idea, like. I've never used GTO Wizard or Ruse, et cetera, et cetera. Although if yeah. I see the grids, the pre-flop charts, et cetera, et cetera, I will understand, okay, well, how they conceived and work. So, you yeah. know, recursively work back to how the machine actually created it. Yeah. But watching Poker Out Loud and listening to pros talk about it, I mean, a couple things. First of all, it's like crazy the speed 
<laughs> and just due to practice, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, you know, this this hand plays such and such, you know, two, three streets down the road, et cetera. Yeah. But is this like a comment? I mean, when you hear those types of comments at that speed, for the persons who don't know anything about poker, is that mm. very common? Not common, do you would you think? Uh I think it's very common. And and this was kind of like where my mind was headed when when I was talking about, you know, the challenge of coaching someone through their thought like to to find their like uh under like the underlying mechanics the way they think about the game the the maybe yep. flaws in those things yep. it comes through when you hear them speak mm. um for a long time about the game and and a really common um a really a really common uh flaw i think in most poker professionals or most poker players thought process is that they're like too complex like they're they're thinking about too many things mm. in the moment and all that stuff you hear on poker out loud, I think is very often like what's shooting through their head, maybe even filtered down quite a bit. Like it's probably 25% of what's shooting through their head while they're, while they're in that situation. Um, and I, and, and when I work with higher level players, I find it really valuable to like, okay, let's, let's cut away, cut away, cut away. Right. Like a lot of the stuff that's swirling through your head is, I, I don't want to, talk poorly about training sites because I work for a training site. I love training sites. I just think that the way we've taught poker for so long has been people lecturing on video. And mm. when, when the whole way you learn the game was just listening to people talk in long form about complicated strategy, then you, then your thought process starts to mimic that. It's like, Oh, well, when I'm in this spot, I'm supposed to be thinking about X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And it's like, that's too many things. Uh, you need to, you can't practically, make a decision I and mean, we're on a we're on a clock usually like we, we have time banks uh you know we got 15 maybe 30 seconds to make right. a, a decision in most situations so like if 10 right. different factors are swirling through your head good luck um so I, I do think that's realistic i don't think it's i don't think it's valuable necessarily i think that's just like the the condition yeah. of poker players who have consumed a lot of information the general public you walk out on the street do you think mm -hmm. that people understand that poker is a calcul largely probability based where have any idea that gto wizard even exists that's a that's a good question i mean uh, i guess in in my in my world like everyone knows that but right i'm i'm not sure i mean i don't and and i wish i had the time to kind of like this this is what i meant at the kind of the beginning of our conversation about the poker community being so vast and diverse and like my concept of the poker community is, you know, pretty, even if they don't practice or or study, they've heard a conversation at a poker table between two pros about a tool or about GTO or about blockers or whatever, like probably. Um, but if their whole life is like a home game where they don't go to casinos, so they don't interact with pros, then no, probably they don't know anything about it. Uh, unless, you know, they've seen the advertisements on, on whatever, uh, broadcast, you get a lot of ads now for GTO wizard or for Prometheus or whatever program. Right. So I, I guess people are finding out that these tools are around. Maybe they have like a little idea of what they do. Does the poker community know that these tools, even such and sophisticated as they are, you know, kind of exist in other walks of life? Do you think? Mm. Do you think that they understand uh, you think, that you're game, thinking about like game financial tools optimal, or just like just the, even the concept of game theory optimal, you know, you're thinking about your even simple, even simple poker logic, like card removal or something like that. And then it affects your game tree, effective stack, mm -hmm. you know, the, every, every, every specialty has its own lingo. Mm. And what I find is like the tunnel vision can be that the people believe in the tunnel think that that's the only tunnel exists and other people don't mm -hmm. know about the tunnel mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying in other words this this language do you think this is a bias that poker players have yeah probably i mean like i don't know i'm I'm no expert in this area but well it's kind of a funny lead into what i'm about to say but you you see a lot of you know uh if you look at poker twitter for example you'll see a lot of <laughs> poker players who only understand poker really who are making, you know, their, their judgments on other fields or kind of yeah. preaching their knowledge in other areas. And it's like, man, you probably, you probably spent like 
20, maybe 30 <laughs> hours on the internet reading about that thing. Like <laughs> not, you know, you probably spent like, I don't know, 50,000 hours on poker by now. Like this, these are not, <laughs> these are not the same. For me, what was one of the most fascinating competitive situations I've ever seen, mm. which is, you know, young man, Landon Tice against Phil Perkins. So you were involved to some degree. So is that right, Kevin? I've seen. Oh, I was, oh, I was very involved. Yeah, I was. That was like my whole life for maybe four or five months. Yeah, for four or five months, and this happened during the pandemic, if I can remember the timing and scheduling right. Some, some. I want to say, that. I want to say, like it was arranged in February twenty one and played out in June of twenty one. Some something like that. June July probably was was how long it lasted. I don't remember exactly how many weeks we played. Let's just first talk about the setup and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Basically, Landon gave gave Phil Perkins a handicap yeah. to be played over a certain number of times. Because I was so fascinated because of its logic that I had seen Solve for Why or uh, Poker Out Loud. And, you know, I've I've listened to their five minute talk, 10 minute talk about a particular hand. I'm saying, you know, my takeaway as the observer was. Oh, these guys aren't faking it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the level of detail and granularity, you know, yeah. is such at a level, okay, this is a game I don't really recognize, you know, that mm. well, right? And Fair. have to replay it, replay it, replay it. Okay, now I get it. You see what I mean? Not, but you yeah. know, they're spewing it off the top of their head, right? So, I mean, that was number one. But now you get to the contest and aside from the preparation and professionalism, et cetera, et cetera, we're not, I'm not going to, I'm not here to throw rocks at Landon Tice by any means, actually. Yeah. Uh, but what really was, was did you not have any say in the structure of the contest? Uh, very little. Yeah, that was a, that was a big problem from the start. Uh, but no, I didn't have much say. And, it and was, you didn't? It, like we... So the 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 timeline was Landon was not the first challenger for uh yeah. I, I believe and I forget who the first person was but there were a couple of different people who were kind of shopping around offers to to Bill Perkins because he had expressed interest in the challenge like Bill this Perkins, not Bill Perkins right now. um so so Bill I think had uh well I know that he had a team like he has a coaching team, he he supports hybrid poker. That's that's the group of people who was um who was coaching him, the the creators of hybrid poker. And I guess that they had kind of come up with the idea, like, hey, you know, you have this training, you have this time, like let's right. try to put something together. I assume that's what was happening in the background. So once a little bit of noise started happening on Twitter, um, one or maybe two different people were publicly, I think Bill. I think he was the one who shared it first was like, Hey, I'm considering taking this bet. Like, what do y'all think was kind of the tone of the, of the tweet. Uh, and then of course, when all these pros saw what was happening, they started bidding. Essentially you get a, a bunch of messages, start shooting out and it's like, I'll play, I'll, I'll give you six big blinds. I'll give you nine big blinds. This is the terms of the handicap if, for those who don't understand. Um, so I think once a bunch of offers flooded his way, and and Landon was one of the ones who who sent out sure. an offer at nine big blinds. Um, you know, the the Perkins team or or just Bill by himself kind of combed through the ideas and it's like, we're gonna take that one, we're gonna take Landon. So the the match was set up before there was a team on Landon's side. Landon did that on his own. Okay. And then after he after he books that over the coming days, it's kind of this scramble to to be like, okay, can can you get it? Can you coach? Can you do data? Can you, you know, right. work on financing? Can you all, all this stuff? Right. So the team's getting thrown together all the while Landon and, and Bill are negotiating terms. So it, it it was like this chaotic coming together of, of the setup. By the time the team was formed, it was like, okay, well, this is what we're dealing with. Like, these are the terms that are already in place. So we have to do those things. Like, let's do the best we can. It's kind of like when you were saying mentorship as far as coaching, I, I, <laughs> I mean, in a way, 
And you see, and again, the analogies to finance, right? I mean, you could be a technical expert, and I'm not disputing Landon's Landon Tice's expertise in poker, run, playing a hand, right? I mean, that that is, yeah. you know, there's going to we can debate whether or not it should have been X big blinds or Y big blinds as a handicap. That's fine, yeah. but when something's so big as the structure of the context, for me, I'm like, well. Let's just pretend, for example, theoretically, and and basically, you. I'm sure, Kevin, you've probably thought about it, right? In other words, put your, all right. How many how many big blinds would Kevin have uh, offered, you know, in that sure. similar situation, right? Yeah. And you thought it was like you know X, but by giving away the tail, by resetting the stack alone, mm -hmm. right? If you're the one who's superior, yeah. I mean, that's like the that's like this option. Uh, in a scenario that you just like never give away almost with, without pushing down the, the blind level or was the nine, do you think adjusted or it was just like totally not considered? I don't think it would. I think it was just like, so public perception, I think it's important to point out that mm. a big part of the line setting was betting on whether or not Perkins would put any effort in. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a given that he was going to show up prepared for the match. Mm -hmm. So in, in some sense, the, the, you know, the Landon team got unlucky that for two and a half, three months or whatever, Perkins had uninterrupted dedication to working on his game and then showed up about as prepared as like, if, if you were betting just on how prepared will bill be when he shows up on June 1st, like, you know, he probably Lost. hit like a top, <laughs> a top 5% preparedness outcome. Like the, you know, if there was just a betting line on that part alone. So that was a big influence over the, it's just, it, it happened to work its way into the handicap over the course of the whole match. Um, so that was a big part of it. So it was, it was the conversation in the background was like, okay, well, yeah, like nine's very beatable if this all happens. Right. So let's prepare the best we can, but let's not, let's not fun prepared. Right. And that was a little bit more what, what ended up happening, unfortunately. And, and, and I think it's a great take of a set of lessons for poker community and for like in general, right. Which is that if I say that there's a blind spot and it kind of dovetails to back that, that tunnel question I was asking you. Yeah. Which is that the presumption that Bill Perkins wouldn't be training or have the capability and capacity, forget resources. We already know he has, you know, a billion dollars. So, you know, it's not about financial resources, but yeah. about capacity to pick up the techniques that poker community has believed to be kind of like it's sacred cow, holy ground that, you know, insiders only can't be attainable when, yeah. do, so do you know, have you read uh, Die With Zero or do you know that he's written this book and, you know, from his past, did, did the team know this? I'm familiar with the book. I I'm not. Uh, I haven't read it. And about his professional background, did you were you aware of it prior, or was the team aware of it prior? Uh, not specifically. Think? I think is I think his broader reputation. Again, this is before the book. I I, I haven't mm -hmm. read it, but his broader sure. reputation was as a uh, an oil trader. Um, right. or I think that was his screen name was oil trader when he when he played online. So that's how that or was it gas trader? Whatever it was, it was either gas trader or oil trader. Right. Um. So yeah, like someone who has has won significantly in the in the a different betting market, right? I mean, that's that's his background, as I understand it. Yeah, I, and I think that that was that's part of it here, which is like if I have told your input, your you know, in a whispered into Kevin's ear, I'm like, yeah, you can talk about playing an amateur, mm -hmm. and you'll have like some you know nine sounds too low then. Right. I mean, yeah. you, you play against me nine's too low. Right. I mean, there's like sure. no way. Uh, but this particular person, the number yeah. of variables, factors in thinking through scenarios, you know, dwarfs 52 random cards. You see yeah. what I mean? In other words, if you think about what affects these different energy markets, I mean, he, and he's he's energy trader. Right. Okay. So it's not only oil, but you're talking about natural gas. So you now you're talking about geopolitics, cross currency, mm. technical supply and demand. Fifty two random items is like nothing, you know, right. in terms of the amount of information inputs 
that he'd had yeah. to assimilate and then survive. That alone yeah. should have told to me. Yeah. Right. When I saw that this was the matchup, I'm like, you know, if you think that he's not going to come prepared or, you know, because you can get GTO wizard, right? That's just money. That's just money of to which he is not, not going to be a problem in hiring Kevin yeah. or a coach to say, these are the key points is not going to be, but it's also the starting even before sitting down, his background was hugely open-minded by necessity yeah. you know, to a number of variables that were much more moving. But then, and then also the, the other thing is that, and, and maybe there's this thing of youth, right? I mean, so sure. he gets a pass, right? <laughs> in, in, in the sense of, you know, I totally understand the motivation, right? You want to make a name for yourself. You need to have the spotlight. You know, that's what this world is for other collaborations. It's in other interests. Those, those all made complete rational sense to me. Yeah. But when you change the contract in terms of, okay, my actual technical edge is X and I'm giving some of that away mm -hmm. by these rules. When I saw, Oh, we're resetting stacks and we're cutting down the number. Wasn't there a time? The, the training time, time was the training time was my big, I, I think we, I think we basically lost the match in, in setting the start date. Um, oh, really? Because it was, it was organized in February and the start date was June 1st. Right. I mean, when, when we got brought in, like, I didn't, I didn't know we were giving him three and a half months to prepare, like what you're, what you're talking about in, you know, his, his background and, um, resources, that's all kind of meaningless if he doesn't have three and a half months, like if he only got two weeks, <laughs> no, if he only right, got two no, weeks to prepare and now he has to like battle it out in his current state while he gets better. Okay. Well then, then the match is no problem, but it's like, he gave him this gigantic window of time to just throw resources and, and knowledge at learning the game. I mean, of course he closed the gap, right? Uh, yeah. In finance, like in this contest, basically what happens is Bill Perkins did exactly what consumers should do in terms of finance. Bill Perkins was the challenger. He's not a professional. He's not a full-time professional poker player. He needed to close the gap. How did he do so? He did two things. He had time, as Kevin pointed out. In addition to that, he changed the rules of engagement or negotiated it wildly in his favor. In finance, you have to understand the rules of engagement. At certain points in time, you can have the factors being wildly in your favor at the right price. And if that performs a particular financial function that you require, then then is the time to engage. Only then. Because in that same situation, Bill Perkins is just like a technical playing of, you know, 10,000 hands or whatever. He would have known that he's disadvantaged. He needed to get it back. How did he get it back? He bought himself time and also the contract was different. So I've been involved in derivative contracts around the globe. And if I could basically try to summarize what it actually is as a whole, as a whole thing, it is party one is trying to buy back tail risk from party two at the lowest possible price. And you know where derivatives are rampant, where they exist everywhere? Oh, energy trading. In other words, you walked directly into an area where Bill Perkins had an abundance of experience. The number of different examples where this exists in finance are endless. In fact, I've now told you about Maximize Your Medicare, my published book. I told you about the second book where I have a publishing agreement. I told you about a newsletter. I told you about two YouTube channels. Let's just get back to Kevin instead. So you've played in head in this type of heads up. In fact, uh, what a month ago? Is it a month ago you were in Texas? Is that right? Uh, that was a little while ago, actually. That I played that match with Doug um, on a break from World Series of Poker. So that would have been like early oh, July see. or late late June. It was right before the main event. When did the broadcast come out? Uh, oh, was it yeah. live well, it at that been, time? It would have been live streamed. Yeah. So we played two days, we played two days, like in the middle of the week. And then the main event started the following, uh, weekend. So yeah, probably like June 29th or something. 
So more crazy stuff. So you're <laughs> a heads up specialist within No Limit, is that? Yeah. And to the to the public, you, they don't know what the nuance would be. How nuanced is it compared to, you know, you're playing a tournament where there's, you know, multiple hundreds of people and et cetera, et yeah. cetera. How would you say how different and just in percentages or scale, et cetera, not, you know, because we're not going to talk about hands. Um, yeah, of and- course. Yeah. I think, I think the big difference um, and, and the, and the skill benefit of, of playing heads up as kind of like a specialty is that you get familiar with playing almost every hand. So, so the big difference is like, you know, you have, you, you register a tournament, you've got anywhere between eight and 10 players at your table. So a big part of the game is, is discipline with your, with, with your starting hands, right? You, you fold hands like pocket fours, you fold hands like ace nine offsuit or something. And, and things like that are just part of like survival. And, and there's all this emphasis on tournament structure and stuff, or, you know, being patient and, and heads up is just, it's the opposite. It's like, you, you have to, you have to go to battle. You, you play every hand, you are constantly bluff, like you're bluffing regularly, basically every other hand um, you're making, you know, your, your hero calling frequently, uh, just to kind of give context to what the game's like. And, and as a specialist, I just got used to that. Like that just became normal. So you, you get used to making like, uh, risky plays, you know, from an, from an outsider's point of view, you get used to like, uh, yeah, just being heroic to some extent or, or not shying away from, from close spots. Um, so that's more what the, I mean, it's just the two of you, you, there's, there's nowhere to hide. Right. And it, it also becomes more sport-like in that way. I think it's more like, well, you know, it's, it's like playing tennis or it's like the matchup of a pitcher and a, and a batter in baseball. Like it's this very, you know, one-on-one psychological, uh, warfare kind of setup, which is, uh, I think pretty different from, from, uh, other formats of poker. Other formats of poker. So talking about sports, well, in sports, right, you're playing tennis against a person, somebody's, you know, five inches taller and more fit than you. (laughs) But when you sat down with Doug Polk, who's also a heads up specialist, right? So, I mean, you're talking about in your specialty. And and he's five inches taller than me. (laughs) (laughs) But you you see my point, you're in your your exact specialty against another person who's in his exact specialty. Yeah. So why would you do this? <laughs> right. I, I mean, did you think you're going to win. Did you think you were going to win? First of all, I, I think I had a small advantage, like, uh, and when I say a small advantage, like, you know, I, I might've been like 51% to win or something like we're, we're talking about, <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about playing for two days in, in person. Right. We, we played a relatively small number of hands, you know, as, as far as statistical significance goes. So the, that's always a consideration. Um, but yeah, in terms of general skill, like I thought I was, I, I thought I was a bit sharper than, than he was just for like modern technical aspects of the game. And I thought that I was doing a few things that were, you know, less familiar to him because his, uh, his career in heads up, I mean, it's not certainly not over. He's still, he's still playing. He's still, you know, producing content. He's still studying. Sure. Um, but, but his career kind of uh peaked in that daniel negranu match so he he did a ton of preparation for that for that match in 2020 i guess it was because it was just before the the perkins um tice match that we were just talking about and uh from that point i i assume that was just like the end of his study right so i kind of knew and i watched a ton of that match so i knew pretty much exactly where i thought his game was going to be at and i was like okay well am i Am I prepared for all those things? Yes. Have I, you know, studied other things more recently? Yes, because I had done some own some preparation of my own when I produced my course. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was just more recent. I was like, okay, I have a few a few extra things, but I mean, did I think I was going to win? Like, I don't, he's really tough, and I think I play tough too. But you know, for for all intents and purposes, it was a 50 50. I thought it would just be fun. Like, not people don't play a lot of heads up. Right. Um, it's not a common format unless it's this big production. So for better or for worse, like, I mean, I don't, I don't mind being on video, obviously I don't, I don't mind playing on stream and it, it helps my business to some extent. So there's always, you know, considerations like that, but just, just from a poker point of view, like I would choose playing high stakes heads up on a stream, even versus like, doesn't really matter who it is, just anyone in the world. I would rather do that than like, you know, 
go to my computer on a Thursday night, load up the best value tournaments that day and play like a session for money. It's just, I don't know. It's just the competitive drive. It's fun for me. It's the format that I, that I like the most. I mean, I think in, in addition to all the nuances, just like in, you know, why I'm having you here, right? There are so many extra nuances that people don't know or see. I, what struck me was the fact, well, first of all, you don't really see streams at your level, mm. you know, on recording, right? In other True. words, you see the you see the live streams, which are largely entertainment, right? I mean, in other words, it's, it's not you and your, you know, your exact layer of quality, you know, sitting at yeah. the table, right? And you've got like drama kings or drama queens or whatever it would be for their own, you know, devices. But you and during that heads up match in Texas, you were actually recounting hands that you had either played against each other or yeah. revealed the fact that you had actually watched his hands and him yeah. in reverse. <laughs> so yeah. and I had yeah. just been watching it. It was even more fun because like three weeks prior, he made the finals of the of the World Series of Poker heads up. And I got to be in the commentary booth for the semifinals and the finals. So that was just like, like literally three weeks ago, I was watching him play against two other opponents in Las Vegas. It was, it was pretty fun, but it's a good point that you make. And I, I should give credit to Doug and and to the lodge um, for, for being willing to highlight that format and like being interested in showing off Yeah, kind of like, yeah. For sure. Just high stakes play for the sake of strategy, for the sake of of quality, and not for the sake of just like you know fluff entertainment. Because again, there's there's different there's different segments of the poker community. Some of them enjoy you know the kind of let's kick back and watch entertainment poker. Let's watch exciting poker. That's fine. That's just not it's not for me. That's not for a lot of people who are interested in in high level strategy. Um, so it's cool to see like a big producer, a big a big stream putting on and it makes sense for Doug and for I know his partner Mike Brady um as well used to play heads up no limit really interested in heads up no limit he did a lot of the commentary during that match so it, it makes sense that like the people who run it there who run things there um they like the game and I want to support that because I like the game too oh yeah I thought that you know when you see that level first you get an appreciation of the fact that oh what I thought that you know, my idea of the game was X. It's like, oops, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not X. It's actually <laughs> Y. And the distance between X and Y, should I be using my own money? <laughs> you know, <for? laughs> this sounds like a bad use of both uh, money and time, you know, and things like, so I'm not sure. It's like that thing where you see like a sporting event. And I'm not sure if you've been involved in sports. I've been involved in sports, uh, individual sports. And then you go and see a pro play. Yeah. And you realize, oh, the number of levels between you and they is yeah. so, you know, wide. It's like, I can't go, go there. Some people are inspired. I get, <laughs> oh, oh man, <laughs> I'm a little yeah. bit bummed out here. I can't, I can't survive five minutes here in, in, the, in the arena. But poker is this cool thing, right? Which is that I don't have to beat a superior player for 10 hours. Yeah. Right? you're sitting in a in a session you're you know because you're you're not playing every hand for example you're you're full ring you're full ring yeah. cash you know the local casino you you know there you could be even the worst player at the table marginally it's, so yeah yeah I've, uh, and i mean and it's no it's no wonder why not a lot of people play heads up format anymore because it's just not that like if you're a recreational player and you want to show up and have a chance it's yeah. not that fun to sit down and play heads up like I, <laughs> I can't imagine i honestly when i when i play it online like i played a lot of heads up online from 2009 to 2015 even 17 18 um but in, it, through those years every now and then i'd just be like why like why are they doing this like why like why is this fun it's just not fun to go and and get yeah just get beat up hand after hand after hand but that's what happens when you're like a lesser skill you know when there's a significant skill gap when there's a significant skill gap and you try to play heads up against a professional it's just I can't you, you just have no you have like no chance and then you go to like six-handed cash games you have a little bit more of a chance but you still get pretty beat up you go to nine-handed cash games you have a little bit more of a chance you still get beat up play tournaments 
you have even more of a chance you play like PLO or other exciting formats with more variants, right? You have more of a chance. So I, I get why most games are moving in that direction. You got, now you've got a new set of headlines, which is kind of cheating with mm. AI, AI transforming the world, not only in poker, but also other, you know, mid journey. And all of a sudden you've become a graphic artist, to, you know, yeah. tomorrow. How much do you think this helps or hurts online poker and your profession generally? Um, How's that for a loaded a good, question? <laughs> it's a, it is a, it is a loaded question. I have a lot of thoughts on this. I was actually just recording a, a video about because I'm updating a few things in my in my course um, for for like the first anniversary, um, and I talked about this a bit because okay, so my my point of view on on if progress like this is good for poker is is almost always yes because i think that it is misguided to try to like contain poker as this thing where like skill will not progress and knowledge will not progress and let's just like keep all the dumb money playing as long as possible and squeeze every last penny like i just don't that's just not how you move things forward. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, that's the opposite, but uh, I just don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's healthy to like try to insulate things and, and prevent progress from happening. Um, But that's also my point of view as a coach and like, uh, you know, someone who benefits financially from, from training tools, getting better in, in some areas of my game, although potentially I, I lose financially in other areas <laughs> if, if I get cheated. Um, so that's the other complicated part of it is like, will all this progress be helpful? I think it's helpful that it's public because I think a lot of people talk about this as if it's like, oh, we flipped a switch. We've like let AI out of the box in poker. And it's like, no, you've been getting cheated since 2015. <laughs> right. And now it's in the public sphere. And now we can actually enforce security measures. And now we can cooperate with the sites and make it more viable to catch cheaters. But like, let's be real. I mean, be, like people have been cheating at poker ever since the origin of poker. Right. And and it's just when you, when you move tools into the public and you teach people how they work and you let people use them at a lower cost and you make them more available to all the, the, the sites that um, enforce security and, and, and enforce gaming regulations and all that stuff, then like you make them better equipped to deal with what they're, what they're up against. Um, it, it's a little bit outside of my expertise to say, can online poker handle these tools? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, they're really powerful. I, I get that. I don't really have an inside look at like what cheating prevention looks like from, from the other side. Um, but I, I do just kind of generally feel like, yeah, this is, this is just major progress in the public training sphere. That's good for me. I think that's good for poker. I think that's good for players. I think it advances competition. I think advancing competition is just good for the general industry. Um, but for online poker specifically and the safety of online poker specifically, I think a lot of that hangs with how the operators handle it. The operators. And and yeah. how the and how the gaming like uh regulators handle it. I mean, if I just play devil's advocate just for kicks, uh one would be that okay, so I'm now 18 years old. I, you know play this fascinating game, it's probability based, et cetera. But then I realize, oh, there are all the, the competition here has have, have access to these. Well, first of all, there's, I don't know anything about poker. And all, I thought it was just, you know, you show up in holsters and a, you know, cowboy hat and you, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you, you start YOLOing everything, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But I think the the fact that AI is involved is telling people, you know, very similar to DFS, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, I'm not sure if you have ever, you know, like DraftKings, they've got- um, I, have, these, I have a loose they, familiarity, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you're keep creating a portfolio of teams. And when I listen to their podcast, I'm like, well, actually this is just a portfolio optimization that they're doing when they've just tweaked a parameter. Yeah. And, and literally that, and, but- now all of a sudden you had this idea. Well, I got some my my favorite player is playing against a bad team on Sunday. I'm going to just pick him, and that becomes the basis of your team yeah. selection. And now all of a sudden you realize, 
you're playing against simulators who are running optimized portfolios of teams, you know, yeah. and then and having 150 entries or whatever it is, whatever their maximum is. And you, and you realize yeah. as a recreational DFS player, well, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you've just torched the, your $20 or whatever. Yeah. It is. You're, you're... In poker, don't you have that? Don't you run that risk? Yeah, for sure. And and something that came to mind just in terms of like um, cultural shifts over over generations of online players, even like if if I think if I think back to the people who were playing online, you know, in 2003 or 2000, I think the, the online started to really pick up in like 2005 and onwards, but but it existed in 1999, I believe. Um, those people had no tools whatsoever, right? You log on, you open the site, you play. But right. After a few years, tools like like trackers came out where you could, you know, download the hand history uh, in real time and, and you could store your results and you could store statistics. And like all of a sudden those people had an edge. Right. And, you know, but within five or six years, I'm, I'm sure you found, you know, an earlier generation of professionals who thought like, oh, these like these kids are cheating, like they're they're using they're using this advanced software to get an advantage, you know, to get an edge on us. Who are just sitting here playing like it's unfair right and then every new generation that came through had like a little more technical um resources with sure. them and and the operators decide which ones are okay and which ones are not okay right so it, mm. it it kind of becomes more and more accepted over time to use more and more technology and and right now you know there's i i'm aware of players I, i'm obviously not i'm 34 now i'm not that close with the people who are 18 and starting online poker but my understanding is a lot of people who are coming up now have like mixed feelings about what is ethically acceptable to use in game because it's not clear cut and even real-time assistance to some extent has gone through phases of being like acceptable or unacceptable um different levels of of real-time assistance so it's like like some people just have different ethical standards. Some 18 year olds are going to come in and be like, well, of course I reference this preflop material while I play. Like, why would I not? It's, it's a competitive right. advantage. I'm just using tools that they allow me to use. Um, or even if the sites don't allow it, it's like, oh, well, I can use this third party device. I can log into my virtual PC. I can use that. And it's like, oh, okay, it, it, for sure. It's okay. Like everyone's doing it right. Like this kind of mentality happens a lot. And I'm sure it happens in, I mean, I'm sure when you get into the world of trading and all of that i'm sure ethics at some point have like veered way out of the picture for some people and yeah of course and it's all sure. and it's easy when you're wrapped up in this stuff to just like forget that you're competing against other people um and view everything as numbers on a screen and view everything as just like i got to find my edge and i get that like i've i've been there when you know when you're when you're young and you and you're trying to make money at this thing like i get it um, but I just have a different perspective on it when I go into the casino and I sit down with people and I'm, and I'm actually playing like against humans and I, and I meet those people, uh, you know, that's, that's why it's hard. Um, it's hard to define everyone as part of one community because like you do have these, these bad actors, so to speak, who aren't even necessarily bad actors. They're just looking out for themselves mm -hmm. and they're not involved in the broader community and they don't care about the broader community. Right. They just care yeah. about trying to yeah. trying to win which is you know that's it's kind of fair to them there's there are some developments right where they're trying to enforce safe or fair play or something like that and i haven't i just see like again twitter yeah. i'm just like scrolling through twitter and see see them that what re reshuffling cards after they've been mocked in uh, for online i, I want to say for plo or something like that uh Oh. to detect to discourage you know people playing multiple tables or you know multiple oh i don't know you and your buddy like sitting at the same table you oh, know interesting the same, uh, that the, that the card would be put back into the muck if, if you fold it in other words you don't get to see your cards there's something on oh, i hadn't heard of this but it it sounds it sounds like a like an attempt to curb uh collusion like card sharing yeah. so you you get rid of the advantage you might have by sharing cards sharing folded cards with another player oh, that's right. an interesting idea i hadn't heard about that yeah i think it's just over this past week and like i said yeah. you know i i like to procrastinate my professional work so i just 
<laughs> I have like poker content running on podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> like yeah. just, just to avoid like the, the real world, uh, like many people, I'm <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. But you know, the things like that technology can be twisted, can be adopted to do that. And that to me sounds like w- without knowing a thing, right. Just being an observer, a casual observer, mm-hmm. it'd be unsettling. It'd be unsettling, right? Because you've mocked and then you end up seeing cards. Uh, <laughs> let's just say now now your turn card comes up. Yeah, that is. Yeah, <laughs> and it, I mean, it's, yeah. You, I don't know. It's an, it, it's an interesting idea. I guess if it's like, I guess if it's communicated well, what they're doing and why they're doing mm-hmm. it, like maybe within six months, it just becomes normal and everyone's used to it, right? But it, it's, it seems like good progress from, I like when operators try stuff like that because it gives me faith that they care about this problem there are some operators who have just like you know and i don't i don't want to single out because i don't know every detail of every operator but like there's mm. there's just been some operators who over the years have had this reputation it's like oh you just you just don't play there that's the site you get cheated on you know like that and and it's hard for me to like to see that some sites treat poker that way but other sites obviously care um and and when they implement stuff like that it's clear that they care well i mean the money alone right on these sites would dictate that they should care isn't that the i mean i i just what what i find it weird yeah. is that they have not banned you know that there's like not like mass banning of if the rules are x and then and those rules are known and clearly yeah. written and if you're violating them that's just you're violating terms of you know terms of service the end yeah. you know how that there are this is fairly black and whitish to me for the yeah. operator point of view. I don't, I don't know. I think I mean, it should be. I, I I think some of the sites, I think it's easier when you have a large budget and you have a lot of revenue as a site, it's easier to like set aside funding for security and set aside funding to like, you know, develop new features when it comes to security. Mm-hmm. I think there's some networks who have just been kind of steadily declining over the years because they're just, they're not that big and I don't think they invest much money in security. So the games have just gotten like more and more cheated, but they keep generating like, I don't know <laughs> if you're, if you're an operator and your mentality is like, Oh, poker is going to be dead in three years. Anyways, like, let's just, let's just burn it out. Right. Like let's not put any more money into this problem. Let's just like collect as much rake as we can over the next three years without spending anything. And that'll be fine. And then they'll just like shift over to casino games. I mean, that might be their mentality. It's it, it's sad <laughs> that some sites are like that, but but you know other the bigger sites I think have a clear commitment to poker being a source of income, not just being like a feeder for their casino and sports book, but at the same time they still have a casino and sports like they understand the benefit of poker to the rest of their business model. Um, I get that, but at least you see rooms and you see this in live poker too, like you people are supporting the win now and people are supporting these these rooms that make it clear with the way their staff run things that they care about poker specifically mm-hmm. being successful and being well run and making money and they don't just care about poker being a feeder to get people into their casino so that they can lose money in the slots which is you know and you can just see that when you walk into a room and those rooms just get more business they get you know they get higher stakes which means they get higher rake which means sure. they get more attention and you, you know the whole thing Tell people how they get a hold of you, your course, and your, your mentorship that you described, Kenneth. Sure, yeah. Um, a lot of my uh, training content, my course, that's all hosted at runitonce.com. So if you're an elite subscriber at Run It Once, you can see my regular videos, just the stuff that I've been putting out on like a bi-weekly basis for nine years now. Um, and then if you if you go to the courses section, you'll see the game plan. That's That's my course specifically. I put that out last year. Um, I'm quite happy with it. And then all of my private coaching stuff uh, is just at my website. It's my full name, kevinrabichow.com. Everything you need to know about that is on there. We'll have the links on below the video for sure. Hopefully you'll join me again, because like I said, we could talk for hours about a I bunch know. of different topics. You probably... <laughs> yeah, we are. I, I don't know that we got to half the list of things that we, do, that we said <laughs> oh, we were oh, going to no. talk about, but we'll, <laughs> no. we'll give it a shot again soon. We will, I would love to have you again, you know, like I said, I've had other types of guests from other walks of life, financial journalist, portfolio manager, pianist, 
I was far more interested in this conversation than any of those. <laughs> I get asked, I get asked for people, can I appear on your podcast? I'm like, oh no, you know, these next, these next slots are for Kevin. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> so, <laughs> appreciate uh, it, Kevin. Thanks yeah. very much. Happy to be here. Thanks, Jay. Thanks again to Kevin. Shaw.com is his website for poker coaching and training materials. Thanks.